1981 is when the British government instructed that there be no exploration of the West Coast potential oil and gas reserves. Michael Heseltine took the decision. Why? Because it was in the direct shipping line of the Trident nuclear fleet. That was just a simple solution. We get rid of Trident and we extract the oil and gas. That's what we're doing in the United States. Now, what happened to the Trident nuclear The reports of that show that we've got nothing to fear but fear itself. Please bear in mind the immortal words of Nelson Mandela. May your life's choices be guided by hope, not by fear. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, think about this. Think about this as I move towards my concluding remarks and then we'll take some questions. 104 meetings, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to travel to the north, to the east, to the west, and then here to the south. I've got to say, I've got to say some things I wish I knew where I was going. <laughs> you can convince sat navs are no water. Where I'm going before I say aye, I say I'll go to Hell's Day. And I thought it was 70 miles north in the left. It's been brilliant to meet wonderful people from all over Scotland. I have to put my hand up and confess here, as a 50 year old man, I'm ashamed to have to admit I didn't realise how beautiful our country is. How absolutely stunning the scenery we have. And you know what? I appreciate it more now. But there's an opportunity cost, brothers and sisters. It's an opportunity cost of doing 104 meetings since January of this year. I'm doubly blessed in my life. I have a beautiful wife, Gail, whom I love. And I've got an absolutely gorgeous wee daughter called Gabrielle. Nine years of age, a wee angel. And you know what? I managed to take up to last night's meeting with Paisley. Over 400 people packed into the hall, brilliant. The reason I wanted her there is because it was near in my house, trees, it's quite near where I stay. And it meant I got to tuck her in at night. Because for many, many weeks now I've not been able to tuck her in at night. And uh, it's made me quite sad. Any of you who are parents will know exactly what I mean. But you know what? The thing that consoles me as a father is I know I'm fighting for my daughter's future. I know, as a 50 year old man, I'm going to benefit from independent scholar because I'm going to live in a better country. But the real beneficiaries of an independent scholar are the 9 year olds and the 10 year olds. They're going to grow up in a country that doesn't have the poverty, doesn't have the social division, doesn't have the grotesque inequality. They're going to grow up in a country with job opportunities, training opportunities, educational opportunities. They're going to grow up in a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons on its doorstep. They're going to grow up in a country that's at peace with itself. They're going to grow up in a country where they don't have to think about leaving it to get a job. That's why I'm willing to give up my time as a father to fight for independence. That's what makes it all worthwhile. My vision might not be yours. We might have she had different visions of an independent Scotland. I listen to people sometimes say that they want to share sterling currency. Frankly, I don't agree. In an independent Scotland, I want an independent, publicly owned Scottish bank that runs a Scottish currency. That's what I want in an independent Scotland. In an independent Scotland. In an independent Scotland, I disagree. I disagree with you being made. I think the European Union is a corrupt big business club that promotes private enterprise, privatised services. I want a referendum so we can come out of the European Union and have bilateral trading agreements with other European countries the way Norway and Finland does. I'm confident that we will continue to trade with other European countries, not because we're in the European Union, but because our goods and services are high quality. I don't agree. The SNP, in relation to a head of state, you see, the SNP say, well, we'll have the, the monarchy, he'll, he'll remain the head of state, it'll be a, a slimmed down 
monarchy. I don't want to put any of them on a diet, they were at Slim Fast. <laughs> Hey, you're not dying, I've got to save you. I just think in a 21st century modern democracy, nobody has any say over my life unless they're first of all elected. That's what I believe should happen in America. So, so we are all the one tent. We all want independence. But within the tent, different visions, different ideas about how an independent Scotland will look. I might lose the debate on currency. I might lose the debate on the European Union. I might lose the debate on elected head of state. I can live with that. Because the people of Scotland will have decided that. That's the difference. If we don't vote for independence, we won't be deciding any of these questions. That's the point. That's the point. In my vision of an independent Scotland, brothers and sisters, 25 years from now, I see mothers sitting with their kids on their knees and their children saying, Mummy, what was poverty? Mummy, what was nuclear weapons? Mummy, what was racism? That's the vision I have for an independent Scotland. We face formidable foes. We face the powerful. We face the UK establishment. Bearing its teeth now. Multi-millionaires. Using the biased media to distort this debate. Bear in mind. Take strength from the verse of the song. Something inside so strong by Lamy Sipri. Brothers and sisters. When they insist we're just not good enough. When we know better. Just look them in the eyes and say, we're going to do it anyway. That's not what we're doing. David's outside, he asked if you take the keys down, he's freezing. He's that beautiful old woman in the front of him. He's kissing the door. Sorry, bro, is it real? It's a brass neck, eh? Folks, it's still your turn. Um, I'm not sure what time it is, I'll often speak for up too long. Can anybody give me a, a time check? Ten past nine. Look, folks, I don't want to keep you uh, longer than necessary, but if we can run it at half past nine, you need to get a hold here, I believe, for ten o'clock. Um, and sometimes people, there's a wee pamphlet here that uh, we put on sale, sometimes people like to sing us in the pamphlet and all that type of stuff. So if we can try and finish for half past nine, we can get all that done. But let's take an opportunity for questions now. If you don't mind just giving us your first name and then your question, and then we'll take it there. There's a chap at the back, and then there's a chap in the middle there. There's a wee microphone going to come round. Hi, Tom, a very powerful speech there, my friend, uh, very exciting stuff. Um, if, we, if we're not capable of getting our own uh, currency, what are we going to do about national reserve banking? Is there a possibility we can look into that and your thoughts on that, mate? Thanks very much. What was your first name, bro? Darren. Darren, my, my position on the currency is quite straightforward. I worry that the Bank of England will try and frustrate the democratic will of the people of Scotland if we continue to share stuff sterling. They will, when we come forward with our house building programme, for instance, and we have a target of 150,000 new houses across the whole of Scotland, and we want to make sure that every local authority has sufficient finance to train the new generation of the plumbers and the joiners and everything else. We need the money there to pay the wages, to pay for the materials, the demand for the bricks, the demand for the quarries, all of that can be generated in Scotland. Probably the economic dynamism there. And the Bank of England can turn around and say, no, we're not releasing the funds. Well, that's why I want us to control our finance. That's why I want an independent Scottish bank. Now, if somebody was to say to me, Tommy, it's going to take a wee while to say everything up. We're going to have to stay with Sterling for the next two to three years. I could live with that. I could live with that. But if 
there's a political decision to be taken and it comes to a, a vote, a referendum on it, I hope people will vote to have their own strong currency. See all this stuff about we're not getting to share sterling? It's a pile of nonsense. I'm nearly said a pile of fish there, but I'm sorry, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to upset anybody. Just say that. The truth is, the truth is, see, without Scotland's oil and gas revenues, sterling would be a dead duck currency. That's the reality. They need our revenue for their currency. There's no doubt in my mind what they're trying to do is they're trying to play hardball. What they're trying to do is, no, no, you're no sharing that, you're no sharing that, you're no sharing that. So that when it comes to the negotiations about the divvying up of resources and liabilities that's going to take place after the 19th of September, right up to March 2016, they'll be able to say, oh, well, we're only going to give that up if we can get X, Y, and Z after you. One of the things they wanted to keep on the table, they wanted to keep nuclear weapons on the table. That, that was the whole plan. If we refuse to give you the currency, keep nuclear weapons on the table, and if you keep the nuclear weapons, you can keep the currency. Under pressure from often the people, particularly the Yes campaign, the SNP government had to come out and say, Trident is non-negotiable. There is no Trident on the table. It goes on the basis of a Yes vote. So please don't be frightened by these scaremongers. I said today, you know, <laughs> BP, BP, I said, oh, we might not be able to trade in an independent Scotland. I thought, yeah, beauty. I thought, yeah, beauty, because as a socialist, I don't want Scotland's oil to be owned by American companies. I want Scotland's oil the same way as in Norway and Venezuela and Kuwait and all the other Middle Eastern countries. I want Scotland's oil to be owned by Scotland's people. I want the oil to be publicly owned. That's what I want. And if need be. If BP want to make it easy for us by withdrawing, no problem, they're not taking the rigs near them, that's for sure. <laughs> but think about it, BP operates in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, but they can't handle an independent story. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> they think we're that! Standard life! This is the company, 1978. Oh, the Scotland votes for devolution, we're going to have to pull out. 1997, oh, Scotland votes for the Scottish Parliament, we're going to have to pull out. They're still here. <laughs> By the way, they're a bunch of bloody crooks anyway. <laughs> and then the friend in Scotland, we should be putting some of them in jail, never mind asking them to stay. That's what we should be doing, standing like. That's the truth of this. This vote next Thursday is going to be a victory for the small person against the big corporations. They've tried to bully us, they've tried to frighten us, they've tried to scaremonger, and we've rejected it all because we have got access now to the social media. We've got access to facts and figures that we maybe did the help 38, 40 years ago. We can't be frightened as easily as they thought we were going to be able to do. So from my point of view, brothers and sisters, I hope that we will be able to get a transition to a currency that we run on our basis, that we control the supply, we make sure that enough is available for the public works schemes that are going to be essential to tackle the poverty and inequality that exists in our country. Because let's face it, folks, we don't want to go in for independence and nothing changes. <laughs> Independence is not a destination. Independence is the start of the journey. The start of the journey to transform Scotland into a fairer, more equitable place to live. That's what we have to bear in mind. Chapter in the front here. Uh, I'm, I'm here, by the way. I just uh, wanted to know your thoughts on a uh, uh, written Constitution for Scotland. Sorry, Hugh, I've got a source of some tech piece of COVID. Hugh, I think it's one of the biggest advantages that we've got for an independent Scotland. For the first time, we're going to have a written constitution. We're going to have a black and white laid out before us 
our rights and our responsibilities as citizens of Scotland, we're going to have written into that constitution. The health service is never for sale. It's public and it remains public. We're going to have written into that constitution that we will never ever again be the whole to weapons of mass destruction or biological or chemical weapons. That will be written into your constitution. We're going to have written into your constitution that every single citizen has the right to a living income. Every single citizen has the right to a place in education, training or employment. I want to go further. I don't want the politicians to write this constitution. I want civil society. I want the pensioners involved. I want the trade unions involved. I want the unemployed and the lone parents involved. I want the disabled citizens involved. This has to be a constitution of the people. I want written into that constitution that political parties are legally obliged to do after elections what they said they would do before elections. I want to do the that thing. I want a rate of recall written into our constitution. It's already in many United States of America states. It's already in many European countries. What does it mean? It means if a politician stands in a hall like this and says, vote for me and I'll do ABC, you vote for them, and then they do the opposite of ABC, you don't have to wait four years to get rid of them. You can raise a petition online, get enough signatures on it, and force a by-election in four weeks, never mind four years. That's the thing. That's the thing. That's the type of participant of democracy I want in a new independent Scotland. Let's face it, folks. Scotland has been awakened by this referendum. We're not going back to sleep. We're not going back to sleep. Politicians are like nappies. <laughs> <laughs> they should be changed regularly. And for the same reason. Well, I'd like to what, what's your opinion if uh, this uh, I see those fair shapes on the new day on the new day yes, talk to the uh, what's your opinion on uh, the future scandal over the next five or ten years regarding education and NHS and the pensions? Peter, I've got to say to you, brother, I think it's a very, very dark prospect for Scotland if we lose this, this vote. I think we will be punished. I think we will be punished by the political elite in Westminster, who will be very angry that we've taken them to the brink. They will want to give us a kick in the teeth, and they will see a wounded animal. They will see a, a country that went so far, but was not willing to go far enough. And I think they will punish us with cuts in services, cuts in education, cuts in health, and they will probably come after the Scottish Parliament itself. UKIP, for instance, a bunch of racists who may, who may be involved in the next Westminster government with a coalition with the Tories, that's what some of the opinion polls are telling us. They have already been on record the same. If they've got any role at all in the future Westminster Parliament, they want the Scottish Parliament abolished. They want to get rid of the Scottish Parliament. By the way, the Scottish Parliament isn't a sovereign parliament. The Scottish Parliament was created by Westminster. The Scottish Parliament can be abolished by Westminster. That's just a fact. So, what do I think, Peter? I think it will be very, very difficult. We are in for a hard, hard time. That 60,000 job losses that I talked about, that are in the pipeline, local government, health, all across the education services, that's as nothing compared to what else is going to come. Because the Tories, and I mean the red Tories as well as the blue Tories, they are going to punish us for daring to stand up here. So my um, description would be that it's going to be very, very dark and very, very difficult here. And there's a young chap at the back here. Oh, sorry, yes. yourself, take you, take you next, brother. We've got time for both of you. Could you go and chat out? Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter.
Well, you go next. What you go for? Hi, I'm David. Um, also, seeing money, I thought it was just a thing to do. To maybe what I talked about was, was the military future of Scotland. I was in the but I think you could uh, maybe, maybe mention one thing that's actually happened recently. It's really good to know that seeing better what we know for us, the Russians are coming. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to know is uh, what would your opinion be on Scotland at the world stage in terms of military and stuff like Gaza and military? Thanks very much, David. Can, can, can I say that? Scotland's going to need the defence forces. There's, there's no doubt about that. We're going to need the defence forces. We've got economic installations. We've got economically important resources, Greensmouth and the oil rigs and other such materials. But I've got to say to you, seeing an independent Scotland, I don't want an invasion force because I don't think we should be needing anybody. I think we should have a defence force. I think we should have a defence force that's to match our needs in Scotland. But not with massive military spending. I, I'm not a big militarist. I want to tell you a story just to illustrate this. I had a wee pal, we, we got him. 19 years of age, we got him. And he used to help you, my leaflet's from Paul, who was standing for a parliament. Um, fantastic young lad, really, really liked him. He was unemployed, to get sent by the government job centre to a catering course to become a cook, and he hated it, just didn't want to be a cook. Went back down to the job centre, and while he was signing on, the military, the army had a recruitment desk. They were allowed to have a desk inside the job centre. And the guy behind the desk promised Gordon that if he signed up, he would get an HGV licence and he would never be unemployed again. He would always be employed with his HGV licence. He would always get a job. Gordon signed up. Six months later, Gordon was sent to Baza. Gordon's no longer with us. Gordon General was born up in Baza. We'd blown up in an armoured personnel carrier that didn't have a reinforced steel floor, which the MOD had been warned about, was required because of the improvised explosive devices that they expected to confront. And I write, you know, we could spend billions of nuclear weapons, but we couldn't spend a few thousand pounds in reinforcing the steel floors of the armoured personnel carriers. Brothers and sisters, you know what? Seeing an independent Scotland, yes, we should have a defence force, but we will have failed and everything we are planning to do, if in the future in an independent Scotland, one single working class kid has to join the army to get an HGV license, to become a mechanic, to become an engineer, that should be available in civilian life, not in the army. Not in the army. Uh, hi, Connor here. My friend and I have a book called uh, KBT Academy for Yes. He got 200 likes in the first two days. Um, by the way, I'm 14, he's 15, so we can't go. But I was curious if you could sum up Scottish independence in, in three words. What would it be? <laughs> <laughs> First word is easy. Freedom. Second word. <laughs> peace. Third word is a hard one. They are both for hope, opportunity, fairness. Equality. I'm going to go for hope. I'm going to go for hope. So, freedom, peace, and hope. That's my favorite. Just sum up, folks, and you can get here when you can get to talk in your wings. Hi, hi, Tommy. I've got a wee bet on you, all right? If I threw an egg at you, right? Are you committed enough to go to run away and cancel the rest of your cure? <laughs> I'll come back to that one night. I'm going to take the last one. I'm going to give you a I think I've enjoyed your presentation this evening. 
I'm more concerned about what's good. There's other things happening in this country and in Scotland in particular. There are a lot of people here who know about it. If you're going to have your constitution and have it voted for by the people for the people, so the people of Paris can take control of the country, why are they not adopting common law as a law of the land? We have various commercial courts. There's all these people in here probably don't know. But the sheriff court in the priest or end or a rear and all the other places that have produced it are not courts at all, they're not going to proper. And all the judges on there are not on the other road. They're basically just lying to the people you hold in there for offences that have just been made up and the police and that are all going along with. What do you think of that? Any any final you know what, I'm, 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 I'm actually holding it here because I'm disappointed because there's an awful lot of women in here that need to ask the questions. So can I get a female? There we go, there we go. <laughs> Hi, my name is Elaine. I would like to know whether Northern Ireland will fight for Northern Ireland. Folks, I'm going to start off. Um, I think, brother, you, you should have an input into the writing of the Constitution because when we have our Constitution get written, we need to make sure that all of civil society has a role. Every part of Scotland has an input, whether it be via email, whether it be local meetings, citizenship meetings. We need a constitution. I was very, very privileged to be in Venezuela in 2003 and uh, meeting with uh, Hugo Chavez and uh, Jose Vincent Miguel, who was the vice president of Venezuela. And they were in the midst of having a big re- a vamping of their own constitution. I couldn't believe hundreds of thousands of people attending weekends, holding up their leaflets, holding up their constitutions. This was supposed to be an underdeveloped country, and they had their own written constitution that determined that their oil reserves should be owned by the people of Venezuela and not by the private companies. That's what they voted for, and that's what they did in 2003, and then they started to tackle poverty and inequality. And I thought to myself, well, if they can date in Venezuela, why can we know that they were mass participation as well? So let's make sure that we're all involved in the rewriting of the Constitution, or writing of the Constitution. Mike talked there about the egg, you know, I've got to say, eh? What a waste of bloody egg, I've got to say. <laughs> what a amount of publicity the boys go to the egg. I remember the old uh, region. Uh, I, I remember 1985, I had uh, graduated from Stillwood. University uh, and a joint honours economics and politics degree, but I was very interested in sport and I wanted to do a sports science HMD, so I went to Cardano College. And in those days, I joined the Labour Party, I was a young socialist, I was selling my military newspaper, and I was standing outside the college, get a copy of Malden, get a copy of Malden, and I had this young guy berate me and called me a reformist and a sellout. You're sowing illusions in the parliamentary road, Mr. Socialism. You should be ashamed of yourself. Jim Murphy. <laughs> Jim Murphy. He was selling a paper at the time. It's called Fight, Racism, Fight, and Pluralism. I think it was the Revolutionary Comedy Park, as he was a member of those days, shouting at me. And I thought, oh, eh, how things have changed. <laughs> I think these three people should have a wee bit longer memories of old Jim. I've got to say, he's had more publicity of a hot with an egg than it did for this to be speaking to him. <laughs> Mike, I think you know what's going on, bro. You need to have me be a lot better than an egg to show you what I'm speaking to him. Another 12 meetings left, and I intend to keep every one of those engagements, whether they're so pass out or not, I'm going to be there. Um, the final point in, in relation to, to tonight's meeting, folks, I, I think it's very important that we all accept that we're not going to be the same in an independent Scotland. We're still going to have our diversities, we're still going to have our differences, we're still going to have our debates, but we're all going to be in the one country. We're all going to be pulling together. We've got a left of centre consensus politically in Scotland. We believe in public services. We believe in public ownership. We believe in looking after one another. That's the type of values and the culture that we've got in Scotland. I think that people can flourish in that environment. You see, people worry sometimes, are we getting the message out there? I read something from the commentator George Monbiot. I don't know if any of you read George Mondo's stuff, he's a fantastic commentator. 
And he wrote something in the Guardian yesterday, which was really, really profound. He said, if Scotland votes for independence, it will be a victory for the social media over the corporate media. Because you know what? Corporate media have ignored this. Corporate media have distorted the debate. Corporate media have fed us a pile of bullshit. But what we've done via the social media, via the Twitter, via the Facebook, via the YouTube, is we've got the message out there. We've actually managed to educate hundreds of thousands. I've got a wee pamphlet. I'm hoping that you can afford a quid before you go the night. This wee pamphlet was written as a result of a speech I did in Kirkcaldy on the 23rd of January. Home over fear, it's called. I spoke Kirkcaldy in front of 300 people and somebody filmed it. They put it up on YouTube in February. It's now had 155,000 views on YouTube. 155,000 views for a speech. Come on, who goes on to YouTube for speeches? <laughs> Does that not illustrate the thirst for knowledge, the desire for the arguments that are required to convince the family, to convince the workmates, to convince the community? That speech is now being turned into a pamphlet. So hopefully you can get on it the night and get some of the arguments, give you some of the debating points, so that you can convince everyone that we can take control of our own destiny, that we can stand up and be counted. Well, as a sister, I think tonight has been an excellent meeting. I want to um, thank Henry. I want to thank all of the Yes campaigners who have been working very, very hard. I hope some of you who have came tonight as yes voters, don't leave as yes voters. I hope you're going to leave two feet taller as yes ambassadors, as yes crusaders, as yes campaigners. For those of you that came along and decided, I hope we've given you enough arguments tonight to make you make up your mind, enjoy, decide what we hope and vision. For those of you that came along, maybe you were no voters, maybe we've no swayed you completely. But hopefully we've got you to think again. Brothers and sisters, we have got everything to win here. Everything to win. I think we've got nothing to lose. Nothing to lose but an abusive relationship. That's what we've been in for far too long. An abusive relationship where they've used us for our resources and they've used us as a dumping ground for their nuclear weapons. We're not going to be in that abusive relationship any longer. I want to finish with a quote, brothers and sisters. A quote from a trade union leader, a guy called John Larkin from Ireland. He was the leader of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. John Larkin was involved in a dispute in 1913, trying to organise the dockers against the very, very powerful dock owners, the billionaires. And they tried to starve the dockers and their families back to work. They tried to break the dock workers union. And Jim Larkin said something then which I think should fire us up now when we face up to all these multi millionaires. He said, The powerful only appear so because we are on our knees. Arise. Well, as the sisters, we'll see you next Sunday. Let's arise and vote yes for independence. Thank you very much.